are Vineyard. Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. I was in my bedroom with my guitar, and I was reading the Psalms, and I came across that one, and I picked up my guitar and started playing it, and then I taught it at our home group. It was maybe a matter of a week, so I taught it at home group the next week, and there was something really special that happened. When you wrote it, did it feel special, or were you just like, oh, this... When I wrote it, I was just writing it for home group, and yeah. I love singing scripture. I grew up, I lived in Hawaii for a few years, and then up in San Francisco, and so the Jesus movement was happening at the time and a lot of it was straight scripture. And I just loved it because it put something in me that I really cared about. Seek ye first, you know, Karen. All of those songs, those were life-giving for me. So it didn't feel funny to sing scripture. Yeah. And sometimes you read a verse and it sings to you. It does to me. So sometimes I would read it and all of a sudden I'd hear a melody or I'd have a sense of the, the phrasing of it, which is what happened with Exalt the Lord. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. This week, we're launching a mini-series around a very special session from our national conferences this summer, a story of the Vineyard in Song, where we explored the themes that have marked the moves of the Spirit in the Vineyard since it began in 1974, and some of the associated songs. In this episode, Adam and I interview Cindy Rethmeyer. Cindy is one of the pioneering female worship leaders in the Vineyard, having written such songs as Exalt the Lord and I Bow Down. Cindy beautifully led us in worship during this session of the national conferences and poured out wisdom in this podcast. Let's listen in. Cindy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming to Ohio. You're welcome. It's my because pleasure. Because I know it was your dream to come here and just experience humidity, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, it's a little similar to home, if I'm honest. No, <laughs> my... you, you listen. You, you're, you're preaching to the choir right yep. now. I know That's about right. humidity. <laughs> but thanks for coming. You're welcome. And thanks for working with us on A History of the Vineyard Through Song. Uh, sort of the point of this podcast is uh, we're just imagining this as a continuing conversation it's just sort of flowing out of that night. So if you were at the conference and you experienced that session, or maybe you watched online, or maybe you're like, I don't even know what this is. Well, then you should go back and watch it on one of our channels. But this is just a conversation that flows out of that. And we just want to get to know you a little bit better because you're one of the pioneers of vineyard worship. Is it okay yeah. for me to say that? Yeah. Makes me sound really old. I'm not that old. <laughs> well, no. But yes, I am a pioneer. It's true. Yes. One of those people. Well, okay. Before maybe we go official here, like you were the first female worship leader in the vineyard, right? Yeah. Was there anybody who preceded you? Patty Kennedy and I were kind of right alongside each other. But uh -huh. mine, mine started back with Carl calling me up to stand beside the stage and sing the girl part. Because, you know, it was back when there were <laughs> echoes. Besides the stage. Oh, yeah. Not I never on went the on the stage. Nope. Didn't go on the stage. Okay. Carl's going to hear this and roll his eyes. But it's true. He's apologized to me several times. But we were in the gym, and he would say to me before church, because we all came about an hour early to get a seat. And then he would look at me and say, hey, can you come up here? And, you know, we're going to sing, I bless you, Lord. And he said, so can you come up and sing the chorus? I mean, the girls part. I said, okay. <laughs> so then he'd set a microphone down on the stage. And back then, the stage was just risers to hide all of the wires. Because, you know, so it was just four four inches off the ground, six yeah. inches off yeah. the ground. Yeah, so all the, yeah, <clears throat> so everything was, so he'd set down the mic. And then we'd get to a certain song and he'd look up at me and kind of, do his eyebrows and his head and I would come down the stairs or around you know wherever I was sitting and pick up the mic <laughs> sing the girl's <laughs> part then put the mic down and then go back to my seat and I've had a few times where I've told that story and there people say oh, you're the voice because <laughs> they couldn't see a person oh really? you know there were so many people yeah of course yeah you couldn't see who was singing and who wasn't so so that's a long time ago. What year <laughs> is that? That's when it started. That would have been 79? Well, 80? I was one year old. Well, yeah. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> See, I that's that. when all of a sudden I sound really old. No, no okay. awesome. No, I'm teasing. I, I'm happy to be the age I'm at. I'm still alive. So 
the gymnasium is where all the stories started, right? That's when we had things happening when you went into the back room. (laughs) Mm. That was sort of the Calvary Chapel way, right? Yeah. So we do ministry. You kind of do ministry in the other room. John would open it up for words of knowledge. And then when something happened where you had, where the word was about you, then you would go into the back room, which was at the time a weight room. (laughs) So we had to make our way. Oh, yeah. So it was beside the gymnasium, right? You so, just yeah. get, get a little You're, prayer beside the squat rack. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's exactly what it was. So people would go back there and everybody would pray for each other. And then um, we would continue to worship a little bit. And then, you know, and then the night was over. And then they'd have to tear down. So you had to stack up all the chairs, push the bleachers back, because we had to leave it spotless for school the next day. Awesome. Right? Wow. So that was, you know, it, it, I mean, it's wow. just... It was a different day. <laughs> well, that's still, still some church plants, right? Yeah. I mean, that's right. doing the, the teardown setup game. And that's right. It's exhausting. But let me it step is. back just briefly. I would love to hear, how did you end up in that room, standing next to the stage speaking? Let's start, let's start a little bit more at the beginning. What's the Cindy story? Okay, so Steve, my husband, we were friends at the time, and he took me to Calvary Chapel, Yorba Belinda, and... The first meeting, we were at El Dorado High School. So that would have been in 78, 1978. So he took me there, and the first time I walked in, it's the same story that everybody says. I just felt like I was home. Well, and well, so well. We've heard this that, story before. I know, lots on of times, right? Literally, literally on this podcast series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, same more. It is. It's Keep the going. same thing. So. And the only thing that I thought was, they sing for a long time, but I really like this. <laughs> it just felt, it felt like home. And so that was when we were at El Dorado. Then we moved to Esperanza and there was a, it was kind of an auditorium seating style. And I walked up to Carl after one of the services and I said, oh, I was so bold. And I said, did you know that there's a girl part to that? And he said, do you know it? And I said, I do. And he said, okay, well, you can sing it with me next week. And my eyes flew open because that was not what and I was what asking did, what about. What did you mean by girl part? Because I know a lot of the early Vineyard songs, there's like call and response. Yes. Well, Is that Carl's, what you mean? Or yes. did you mean harmony? No, call and response. Okay, yeah. Okay. That's why then I was coming up for just the songs that had call and response. So, <laughs> I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Yeah. I bless you, Lord. Yeah. I bless you, Lord. Yes. Right? That, it was that kind of thing. Yes. Girl guy, girl guy, right? <laughs> I love so, it. <laughs> so that was the first thing. And then I was leading worship in small groups. Mm-hmm. There just weren't very many women doing anything like that. Were you playing guitar? Back then, yeah. Okay. Were so, you always a guitar player? Yeah, since high school. Not a very good one, but enough, adequate. It was enough to write three chord songs, which, you know, Carl, that's all Carl did, it was three chords, right? <laughs> yeah. So it didn't feel like yeah. a really high bar. Yeah. So I felt like I could do it. And mm. if it was a small group, you know, if it was just in somebody's living room, yeah. then it felt like, well, of course we want to worship. So if I have my guitar and we can be in that room. So it wasn't intimidating. And the other thing is that everybody was singing. So there was no feeling of I'm on stage, I'm performing, I'm anything. Nobody even n- noticed me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it wasn't, there was no weirdness for me because I was just part of the room. You didn't have to have stage presence. No, you didn't, didn't have to win the room in some way. No. And when John helped us understand closing our eyes and not paying attention to the person around us, it took a lot of pressure off to be anything more than just, I'm just going to start the song and then everybody sings with me. Mm-hmm. You know, so there was, it, it was very simple and it was, it was accommodating for everybody in the room. Nobody felt like they were, they didn't really know. Or, and the songs were so simple. You know mm-hmm. that, Father, I adore you, lay my life before you, how I love you. Right? So those were, that's where we started. That's, that's what it was like. So it was simple And then we went to the second England trip. And the first England trip, we didn't go because we had a family 
issue that came up. So we didn't go on that one. And then we went on the second one. And by then I was leading worship. And John just, John was so great. He pulled me in and let me sing. And we had really sweet, special moments in England. So that's probably my entrance kind of into vineyard Mm -hmm. culture. And what did it feel like, though? I'm very interested in just what it felt like when you came into uh, the high school, maybe the gymnasium. You know, it's not a bunch of lights. It's it's like no production. I mean, I've seen I've seen the pictures. I've seen a few pictures and I've seen I've heard some very, very, very early recordings, but I don't think they were from the gymnasium. I think they were still maybe from a proper Anaheim building, you know? No, you're, mm. the very first ones you would have heard were recorded by my friend's parents when they ran sound in the gymnasium. Okay, mm. so maybe That's I have heard that. some of the very first ones okay. that you would have heard. So, but what, what, was it, what, what, did, what did you feel like? Okay, so what, we would what, what pull the up to the, we would pull up to the parking lot an hour, at least an hour early, and run from our cars to get a seat. And then we would mark our seat <laughs> and either stay by it or, mm-hmm. you know, hang out with everybody. And then worship would start. And Carl would truly play three chords. I'm not hmm. exaggerating yeah. with that. He'd play three chord songs. And back then, I don't even know if he knew what the chords were. <laughs> so it was very simple. and But there was also John yeah. and jazz. So... The combination of those two, Mm -hmm. and then John's drummer was Dekine, who was his jazz drummer. So we had this kind of mishmash of... Super proficient and ultra newbie. Right. But remember, we're also coming off of the 70s. And in the 70s, there were a lot of songs on the radio that were three chords. So it's not like it was that different Mm -hmm. from what we were hearing on the Mm -hmm. radio out... Well... Obviously, there were big differences, but mm-hmm. the the overarching simplicity of the songs and how you could join in right away. We had no overheads. We had we didn't have any of that. And if somebody wrote a new song, how did it get introduced? There's no ever. There's no overheads. You're in the. Were there new songs? Yes, there were okay. new songs. But usually, a new song started in a home group and then ended up being something that the whole church knew and we all started singing it. Okay, so, so, yeah. so you would you would start the song at a home group. You'd be like, hey guys, Always. I brought a new song. Yeah. Always. And you'd be like, hey, let me just teach you this chorus. Yeah. People are I like, mean, great. Exalt the Lord, we did, gosh, I bet we sang it for a year in our home group before it, before there was life on it with anything else. And I wrote that thinking that we'd sing it in our home group. That was the mm-hmm. point of it, was yeah. this sweet... And we have some beautiful stories from that home group setting, not the, I mean, that was really meaningful and helpful for people. And we had these really sweet times of worship together and it was maybe 30, well, we had big home groups, but it, you know. How many people? Anywhere from 30 to 75. You know, it just depended it. The size on of the average was. vineyard church is 75 right. well, but now, but that was your home group. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I love that because what it, it, again, it points to the hunger that was just sort of around at that time, right? Mm -hmm. And remember, too, that we didn't have the internet. We didn't have any of that, right? So John would write a story, I mean, a song, and or we'd even teach a song at church, and it would go to around the world the following week. Somebody would be singing it in Africa, South Africa, or England, or, and it was shocking because it was just because somebody had been there that week and then took it home with them Mm -hmm. because you didn't have internet, you know, yeah. there was no, no way for it to travel like that. It's so amazing. That so organic. Was the way. Yes. Yeah. And so it would go around the world before we even knew. I mean, we barely knew the song and they were singing <laughs> it in South Africa. Yeah. Mm. Right. And then I say this in the interview on Wednesday night, but, but the, when Isn't He was written, that song rocked us. I mean, it, it really moved us as a people. And where did you hear it first? Well, I was in Europe on a 
trip for my graduation. Yeah. No. <laughs> so I was gone, and I got an, a letter that was sent to the American Express office, and I opened it up, and the last part was, by the way, John wrote the most beautiful song. I can't wait for you to hear it. And so then I came home. Who wrote the letter to you? Penny Fulton. Oh. And then I came home, and the first time I heard it, I, I was stunned. And echo yeah <laughs> it was yeah yeah so wonderful. so wonderful. It, that's the type of songs that we were doing back then yeah. right where the the echoes you're like there's but, a part for me yes exactly <laughs> so we that that's just the way that the songs were introduced and then grew and john john was in the league of his own i mean he was a, an incredible songwriter and now, his songs, he wrote chords that I could never figure out how to play them on yeah, my guitar. Yeah, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. I don't even know where to put my fingers for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not adding nine. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm not doing so, any of this. <laughs> but, but, boy, when he sang them, it was such, those are such sweet memories of that. Him singing Spirit Song and Isn't He and, yeah. Okay, so I have another question about, like, high school days. Because I've seen some of the photos where... Uh, I, Carl's in the photo. He's up front. He's got like looks like an ovation or something. You know, he did have an ovation. That's yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just super oh, yeah. funny. Like <laughs> yeah. Carl's up front. I, I've seen this photo a bunch of times. Carl's up front. He's got his ovation. Somebody else, who's playing bass? Jerry. Jerry who? Jerry. It's oh, okay. Whatever. My mind just went blank. It's fine, Jerry. I'll remember by the end. And then there's the drummer, and then John's got his roads, and, mm -hmm. and then there's like a Bible up there, right on right on top of his roads. Yep. So just because he didn't even leave, he just sat there. Okay, and this caught. is my question. This is okay. <laughs> say, just say more about that. Yeah, he would just finish. They would finish what they were doing, and John would <laughs> just teach from his roads, you know, from his chair. He just would keep going because it. I mean, I'm serious about it. Just being a riser. It. Yeah. You know that was what it was. Now he could stand up next to something but i don't even remember how long it was before we had a podium i mean that felt really different mm. <laughs> to see a podium up there so he would just stand up or sit down sometimes he would pace back and forth but a lot of the time the sunday sunday nights were the sweetest times those were really amazing that's where so many things happened you know deliverance and healing and people would be worshiping and all of a sudden you'd see them start sobbing and eyes closed and they'd finish and the story was yeah I I just walked through this really hard thing in my past and now it's over you know it's done or someone would say I think I got healed physically you know during that happened all the time right so it was pretty wonderful and meaningful that way I think and there was expectation Yes, and how, much, and how much prep time is going into that, that Sunday night meeting? Oh. Is that, are people just kind of showing up and yeah. like, okay, hey, well, we'll do this. Well, yeah, well, John, you're going to teach something? Well. Oh, John never talked about what he was going to do. Yeah. No. He, he just he just would just open his Bible and start oh, yeah. riffing. So he never talked about, I, he, I never knew what, we never knew what he was going to talk about. But Carl would get up, he, he probably told them the songs, but there wasn't really, there there wasn't a rehearsal time, per se. It's not nothing like what, because again, all it was was sound check. Are the chairs all set up? Okay, let's start. Let's yeah. try and start on time. <laughs> you know, and then we would yeah. just go. It, and somebody had to be recording because we had all those recordings that you've heard. Yeah, that would be happening too. But that was my friend's parents, just in the middle of the room hmm. with their tape recorder. Okay, did it feel like it was cutting edge? Did this feel like you were doing something important? <laughs> no. We just thought we were a part of a church that things were happening. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. There was life here, and yeah, it felt, it that's felt what we wanted vibrant, to do. It felt vibrant, but it didn't feel like you were changing the world. Oh, no. If you had told me that back then, I would have kind of giggled about it. I mean, <laughs> it would have been a funny thing to have heard. Now, we did know that something shifted when Lonnie came. Hmm. The say, night that Lonnie say, say came. Say more about that. Yeah. So... And we're talking about Lonnie Frisbee here, for those of you who don't know. I remember what I was wearing. Wow. Because it was such an impacting, yes. you know, night. So he said, he 
taught one of the weirdest sermons I've ever heard. <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason to it. He, yeah. did, he wasn't really following a course. I remember him telling us to get out our pens and to write down his grandmother's address so that we could all write her a letter. And then he talked about watching cartoons, and <laughs> it was very disjointed. And then he said, I want everybody 25 and under to come forward. I don't even know how he got from where he was at to there. But he called all of us up, and I'm just telling you my experience. He called yeah. all of us up, and then he put his hand up, and he started from one side. With his hand, he was far away from everybody. He started from one side just like this, and as his hand moved across, people just started falling falling like dominoes. Yeah. It was very surprising. And there Did were, he have this reputation before? Did people know when Lonnie shows up? I didn't up? know Lonnie. Okay. That you was didn't my know? first experience. You're like, what with is him? going on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know anything about him. So he, you know, put his hand up and people started falling. And there were there weren't very many people standing by the end of it. And whoever hadn't fallen was in awe of it. But I do know that John said that at least half of the room got up and walked out. Wow. And he thought, oh, no. And then I remember him telling me about Tommy Coombs. Do you know that name? I don't know. So Tommy called him the next day and said, the Lord told me to tell you that whatever happened last night is him. And who was Tommy? Why would that be important? Well, he had a vineyard in Colorado. Okay. He had been part of one of the Jesus bands. Okay. And so it was. It was just meaningful for him to. And that's somebody call that, that John that. would have listened to yes. and he respected. Trust. Yes. Yeah. And he didn't know anything. Again, no mm -hmm. internet. No. Yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> no yeah, Instagram. This is what happened last night. Yeah. You know, look, it Lonnie, wasn't uh, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, that was really. I remember being really fascinated by that. That. Because again, this was all new ground. It's not like we had done this before, or right. we had been a part of something like this before. That's not what it was. So and so, growing up, were you like a, were you like a super spiritual kid? Were you like a super Christian? No, I did grow up in a home where I was cared for. My parents went to church all the time. We were a part of something like that. But I hit a, I hit a point in time where I thought there's got to be more than this, mm. and that was where being in the vineyard there was a more than this that happened. I will say that relationship was key in that time. So having the people that we ended up being in relationship with because of kinship groups, small groups, that was a really essential part to being in the church that way. And we weren't separated out. We, we were young, but we were all in kinships with somebody who was a grandparent. Yeah. You know, we, th there was no age yeah, the young, young adults know. and youth yeah. group or whatever. I remember the very first women's retreat. They said, oh, are you, are you girls coming? And we looked at them and we said, we're not women. They're all, <laughs> well, what, <laughs> what do you? you think you are? Yeah. Yeah. We're like, we're girls. They said, no, this is for yeah. you. Okay, so this is when so Kay, Kay Smith, Smith shows up. Yeah, she was the speaker. And she told us stories about how when she was a child growing up that she would set all of her dolls up and then she'd come and pray for him and push him down. <laughs> I remember her talking about that. And I think it was th a time when the women, when there was suddenly, it felt like for me, there was a community of women. And that was meaningful for me because we're, we felt like kids. And so to have other women mm -hmm. that were ahead of us in life, yeah, that that was helpful. So I think that the relationships meant as much as being at church together. Those yeah, relationships was, were precious. Yeah, and some of them community. I still have. Yeah. yeah. Still to this day. Even they're better. speaking into my life. They they're who I will turn to if something comes up. I would call them and say, Hey, you know and that one of them is that that's the couple that we had home groups that were seventy five to hundred people. Amazing. In the house. So. Okay, let me shift gears here. Okay. Talk to me about Exalt the Lord. You you were leading worship a little bit. You, you said earlier you 
kind of wrote it just for your home group. Yeah, I was in my bedroom. Yeah, okay. Facing the wall with my guitar. And I was reading the Psalms, and I came across that one. And I picked up my guitar and started playing it. And then I taught it at our home group. It was maybe a matter of a week. So I taught it at home group the next week. And there was something really special that happened with it. And When you wrote it, did it feel special? Or were you just like, oh, this... When I wrote it, I was just writing it for home group. And yeah. I love singing scripture. I grew up... I lived in Hawaii for a few years and then up in San Francisco. And so the Jesus movement was happening at the time. And a lot of it was straight scripture. And I just loved it because it put something in me that I really cared about. So Seek Ye First, you know, Karen. All of those songs, those were... Those were life-giving for me. So it didn't feel funny to sing scripture. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you read, a, you read a verse and it sings to you. It does to me. So sometimes I would read it and all of a sudden I'd hear a melody or I'd have a sense of the, the phrasing of it, mm. which is what happened with Exalt the Lord. And then we, uh, one of my friends, Daphne, was there, Daphne Rademacher, and she said, we have to record this, which that would have been 1989 when I wrote that. And I, I mean, that just seemed really outside of anything. So she took it to Brian and Brian decided to record it. And when we, when he came down to California to do it, they said, the producer said, you know, you're singing that one part over and over again. He goes, it seems like a lot. <laughs> Brian said, trust me, mm-hmm. we'll just do it. And I listened to that recording recently, and that was it was really special being there that night. I don't think it was really special just because I was I wrote it. It was special in the room. Yeah. So I know I know it's special in the room for even like what we're doing now. Yeah. Right? Like it yeah. just persists. I, it, it blew the room apart in Denver. Mm. One of the coolest moments of the night. Yeah. I think the most meaningful story that I heard about that was when John called me. He had gone to, I think it was Korea, but I'm not sure, South Korea, but somewhere, an Asian country, he went, and they were doing a big, one of those big events, you know, in a stadium. And he called me, which he had never called me before. So yeah. First it time. felt pretty special yeah. Yeah. to get the phone call, and it was John on the line. And he said, Cindy, I wanted to tell you that I was there for the conference. And he said, and they had just had some big concert in the venue and the pastors just wanted to clear the air kind of. (laughs) And so all the pastors as a group walked the stadium singing Exalt the Lord. Amazing. And that that was really meaningful. Mm. Because yeah, so when get you that wrote the song, you weren't like, I'm going to write something for Korea. Yeah. This right. is for I'm the Korean. Hit. It's going to go around the <laughs> yeah, world. Yeah, I'm going to write something big. It'll yeah. be for Korea. Yeah, this is stadium. John taught us that. You never write for an audience. We're writing because this is this is our voice, our expression, yeah. our our offering, you know, of what yeah. what we want to sing or what, you know, or what we feel like God's singing over us or, you know, that was kind of, so it was never about where it was going to go. It was shocking when it went places like that. My friend wrote to me from Russia. She went on a trip and she said, we're singing Exalt the Lord in Hmm. Russian. So those types of moments were unbelievable because we, I mean, who knew? Who knew? No one can. didn't know. No, you can't know. And you can't plan it. You can't make it happen. No. Even if you want to, you can't make it happen. Even if you you want to. But you did have some really key things when you tell this story, which... You were in scripture. You were writing from scripture. Mm-hmm. You had a secret place with the Lord. You're facing the wall in your bedroom. Mm-hmm. No one knows what you're up to that day. You could have been doing anything. But then you introduced it in community. And every time I've been with you, you say the same thing. You say relationships were key. Relationships are key. It's so central mm-hmm. to the way that I see your songwriting in your life. And you still have those now. I mean, we were just talking before we turned on the mics about you and Brian still write together. Mm-hmm. So how do you maintain and find the people 
that you can do that with for a long time? What does that look like for you? So I think for Brian and I, we have a friendship that is between the two of us and then our spouses and then his wife, Joyce and I, and then Steve and Brian. We have a relationship that's a life relationship with our kids, with our grandkids, with just our, we do life together. We vacation together, all of that. So there's so much history that comes into that. And then there's a mutual respect between Brian and I. And I think that really matters too, especially when you're in a writing. Because if you're intimidated or you're not sure, should I say this? Or maybe that's a weird note to sing or, you know, Mm -hmm. any of that. But when Brian and I get together, we know we kind of just move into it easily. And there's a respect that's there. Although I will say, I hope he hears this, I will say that when Brian and I write, one time recently he comes to my house, they came for a vacation, and he said, okay, so while we're here, I really want to work on, and I think it was Beholding was the title, and I looked at him and I said, you mean the song we finished? Oh, no. (laughs) He said, said, yep, that's the song. He laughed, you know. So he... He really writes hard and long and he, until he's till he can really sit with it. I've learned that from him to keep listening and keep singing it until we know that we know that the song is done. And so that's a relational thing, yeah. you know. So I that doesn't happen overnight. It takes no, a it doesn't. Yeah. It takes a minute. And we've had that since 1989. We started writing together. So that's a long time. Special. There's other people that I have written with Terry Butler. I love Terry and Casey. And, you know, there are the people that we've written together, but Brian and I can do it, get things going easily because it's just a natural overflow Mm -hmm. to our relationship. (laughs) To your point, that's, I mean, that really is. And we've walked through a lot of things that life has brought our way. And so I think that brings deepening. You know, there's a depth there that, that matters. enjoying this interview about a story of the Vineyard and Song, you'll love watching the session online with friends or people from your church community. Stay connected in the coming weeks as we'll be releasing this session and all of the sessions from our conference this summer, Seed and Soil. Make sure to stay tuned to vineyardusa.org and vineyardworship.com. We can't wait for you to see it. I want to shift gears here for a second Mm -hmm. to talk about worship leading just for a minute. Especially since you're one of the one of the pioneering worship leaders, pioneering worship leaders who's a woman in the vineyard. This started young for you, mm-hmm. but then you're married, and then I know you have kids, mm-hmm. and now you have grandkids. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, what do you want to say about leading worship as a woman through the decades? Because here's one of the things I've noticed. I've noticed sometimes that uh, some of our best worship leaders who are women are leading worship and then they have kids and it's hard to be a mom man. it's just really hard. Like you have little kids and Mm -hmm. there's some demands. You want to be present to your children, to your family. And sometimes, sometimes they, they lose or they let go a little bit, which I totally understand, Mm -hmm. you know, and some, and a lot of them come back and some don't, you know, maybe family superseded, but you were able to, I know be a very present mom and I know for a fact now you're a very present grandmother, but you've been able to be a worship leader. So what do you, what do you want to say about that? And what would you want to say to the other women in our movement who are trying to balance ministry, worship leading, motherhood, children, husband, family, life, soccer? I think there's seasons for everything. Mm -hmm. And so there were, there was a season of being of travel you know, with Vineyard Music, for example, yeah. when we used to do those conferences that were, you know, 5,000 people show up at a conference, there were, there, that was a season. Yeah. And then there was a season when I knew I had to be home. And so mm-hmm. I stayed home. Mm-hmm. And there was worship in that season. And when season. you were staying home, were you saying no to the conferences? S- some of them, yes. Yeah. Or big events? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because. And how did that feel? You need to be home. It was weird. 
and it was a little off. Did you have a little FOMO? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, but I, I, again, I had relationship with older women who were saying to me, sometimes things can happen in this season of your life, high school, let's yeah. say, in this season of your life where all of a sudden it changes the course of things. And I thought, okay, well, then I need to be home hmm. because my kids matter to me more than anything. Of course they Definitely do. more than ministry. Right. Do you know? Yeah, Not Jesus, ministry, yes. right? Yeah, right. So um, I did <laughs> I did stop then. And then there was a season two where I had started writing songs for the kids. And there was a Bible study, and I wrote songs for that. And then they took those songs and we put them on an album, you know, back that was I Want to Be Like Jesus. And so then I was in with the kids, and I actually thought when I was in there, I thought, oh, shoot, maybe I'll never be with adults again. What if I'm never with adults again? And then Andy said, hey, can we meet? (laughs) And he called me into his office, and he said, I think it's time for you to come back in. And I thought, oh, okay, so God has hold of me and sees me, and I can trust him in this. I love that. So then I went back into the adults <laughs> near the big room but i still had those kids things happening and i had been writing hit songs for my own kids since they were babies yeah. so that wasn't a foreign thing for me and now i've written about 20 something songs for my grandkids Isn't that great? and so that's because that's the season of my life that's the mm-hmm. season i'm in right now so when i i have a brand new grandson he's well not brand new now but he's almost a year and when I sing his name, his whole body lights up. Everything in him. If he's crying, he immediately turns to me and smiles. That's worth everything to me. Yeah. So that is my season. This mm-hmm. isn't a season where I'm constantly on a stage or doing. Actually, with Brian, for this that we're doing, that's the first time I've sung in a long time. So my season, there's just a different focus. There's focuses that change, you know, and I think I had told you that um, before Denver, I saw that picture of open hands, and I realized that it's really easy to have something given to us. So it's this gift. It's in our hands. And for for me, my hands would close tightly around it, and pretty soon I've got a fist, Mm. not an open hand. And one of the things I learned through the years is that when a season comes, hopefully you have open hands because it's way easier (laughs) When your hands are open instead of having to be pried finger by finger apart. And it became my joy to turn something over instead of my despair. Mm. So instead of it being an awful thing, it was a beautiful thing. That's a word. And I think that's going to encourage a lot of moms. Yes. You know? Encourages me sitting here. This is, I mean, this is, I mean, this is also true for the guys, but it's just not the same. It's not the same. I've just seen it over and over again. No, I agree. And and I've even seen my own wife deal with, oh, am I ever going to come out of the house again? That's right. Am mm-hmm. I like, oh my gosh. And then you do, of course. Yeah. Yes. And things happen, but you're like, am, is it ever going to? Because you feel like you'll be forgotten. Yeah. That's where it, yeah. that's what it ends up. And to your point, Nicole, that, that, that thing of how do I stop enough to see what it is that's right in front of me that I need to take care of right now. And it is the thing that you look for the whole of your life as a mom. It's your heart living outside your body, right? So you're constantly, and I think that's the key to it, is that you're constantly asking the question, looking for the cues of when it matters. So when my kids were in high school, it mattered that I was home. And so I had to not worry about what was out there that I was missing out on because this that's right in front of me was the season that I was in. And my grandkids, it's just so meaningful to do life with them because it's the day in, day out life that transfers to them, right? Carol Wimber Wong said to us once that that was one of the reasons that she stopped going on the conferences with John was because she would say things and it was good. It was not like she thought it was bad that she was out there but she said you know i can say something and maybe someone will hear it and keep it for a time 
But my grandkids and my kids, that's who I'm doing life with. And if anyone's going to catch anything from me, it's going to be them. And yeah, they'll keep it forever. Yes. And I realized, oh, again, these were those light moments where these older women were saying things that were treasures. And so when she said that, I've never forgotten that. So being in those rooms, like when my grandsons come over and spend the night, I know there's something happening. Mm -hmm. That's a God moment. That's a human moment. That's a transference that may just be about dinner, but that's it. Yeah. Why don't we do this just to land? Because this has been so cool. Cindy, you're clearly uh, not just a pioneer of vineyard worship, but you're one of our you're one of our one of our mothers. You know, uh, is there anything else that you would want to say to our vineyard worship community or to the vineyard in general? You, you know who we are, and you have a different perspective and a different seat. Is there anything you want to say to us vineyard people? I think that I have realized that when John was talking about, I guess my view of John talking about naturally supernatural has shifted in that, I realize now that my day in, day out experience with whoever is right in front of me, whether it's at the farmer's market mm -hmm. or the bank yeah. or my grandkids in front of me, being present to the person right in front of me has all the potential of being a naturally supernatural moment. And sometimes it's me as a mother or a grandmother, and sometimes it's the exchange of woman to woman or mom with the son or mom, you know, it, it, I never know what that's going to be. And I don't think that's the point is knowing what it is in the moment, but being who I am, being settled with who I am and bringing myself fully into every conversation that I have, those are precious, priceless moments. And so it doesn't have to be in a ministry setting or in a church setting. It can be in a life setting. That's right. And I think that I missed that with John until just recently. I think I've understood that in a way that I hadn't understood it before. So the valuing of the person in front of you, I, I would give that as my, probably my one thing. Mm -hmm. Because I think by loving the person in front of me, I'm loving God. Yeah. And that means a lot to me. And I think the mothering part, I think I'll always be a mother. <laughs> it's just, I think now that's just in who I am, whether it's me sitting down with someone who's young to talk about songwriting, or if I'm sitting down with someone who's young whose child is throwing tantrums. You know, it's, there's something in that that I'll give myself in whatever setting or environment I'm in. And I hope I can do that till the day I die. I think you will. <laughs> and the good news is, is you're not going to die anytime soon. You're here for a long time and we're just going to, we're going to soak it up. Thanks. That's it. Dude. Hey, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing these stories. It means a lot. I know it means a lot to me, but it means a lot to the vineyard community because we, we need to hear mm. from the people who lived it, you know? So thank you. Uh, the stories that we hear are the ones we can live in. All right, Cindy, thanks. Peace. As we celebrate our 50-year anniversary in the vineyard, if you're interested in learning more about vineyard history, there are plenty of resources for you. Check out our show notes for links to books, YouTube videos, and more to learn about vineyard history and identity. And make sure to keep listening to the podcast this year for stories of vineyard churches throughout the year. Thank you.